Welcome and good evening. I'm David Uy with the Chinese American Museum, the first and only museum in our nation's capital dedicated to the Chinese American story. So uh, first, just a housekeeping note. Uh, this webinar is live and is being uh, also streamed on Facebook. So some of you are watching over Zoom, some Facebook. Um, as always, we will put a recording of this discussion on our YouTube channel, usually in a day or two. And throughout this live event, you can ask questions through the Q&A or chat feature in the Zoom, your Zoom window, and we will do our best to uh, get to your questions. Tonight, we have a special treat, part of our Meet the Author series with Grace Lee, the creator of the heist novel, Portrait of a Thief. Uh, it's been named the most anticipated book of 2022 by uh, a number of cultural and news outlets like Marie Claire, Pop Sugar, and Goodreads, NBC News, and, and many others. So uh, it's very exciting for us. So leading us off is Louisa Sorkness, uh, who heads up our programming at the museum. And is usually the driving force behind the scenes. So it's very nice to have you in front of the camera. So Louisa Sorkness. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, welcome everyone to uh, tonight's session. Um, as David mentioned, I, I'm usually a behind the scenes uh, force here. So I, I'm really excited to, to be on the front lines tonight with all of you. Um, just one other quick housekeeping note. If, if I could encourage everyone with questions throughout the program to use the Q&A feature rather than the chat, uh, that is the one I'm gonna be monitoring. And I do wanna fold in as many of your good questions as we can. So do use the Q&A feature if you have any specific questions that you want me to get to with the panel. Uh, so tonight we have the distinguished and exciting opportunity to have this pre-publication interview with Grace Lee to discuss her debut novel, Portrait of a Thief. And Grace Lee, she grew up in Pearland, Texas, and is a graduate of Duke University, where she studied biology and creative writing. She lives in Northern California and attends medical school at Stanford University. Uh, Portrait of a Thief, as I mentioned, is her debut novel and is currently in development at Netflix, uh, with Grace serving as an executive producer for the series. So welcome, Grace. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, also on the panel, we have uh, Holly Shawn. Holly is a first year student at Georgetown University School of Medicine. She is a graduate of Emory University, majoring in neuroscience and behavioral biology. Uh, also on the panel is Kevin Wong. Kevin is a junior at Harvard College. He's studying history with a minor in government. Uh, he's uh, writing a thesis on medieval law and served as president of WHRB 95.3 FM, the undergraduate run radio station. So welcome guys, I'm excited to have this conversation with you all tonight. Um, Kevin, Holly and I actually had the privilege of reading the book already. So. This pre-published novel um, was an absolute pleasure. So I'm gonna bring them into, oh, there, Holly's showing it off. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, hands on it, not even on the shelves yet. So I'm gonna loop in Kevin and Holly in a little bit to talk more about uh, the themes of the, of the book, but I do wanna just uh, chat with you, Grace, uh, to get started. I uh, just wanna get to know you a little bit better. Um, you're a med student by day and a writer by night. Um, it already sounds like two full-time jobs, so <laughs> she does it all. Um, but just to get started, I'd, I'd like to hear about um, how you came up with with your with with the novel, with Portrait of a Thief. What was your what was the process of writing? What was your inspiration? Um, just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you so much for having me here. I am so delighted to be here and for our conversation tonight. Um, I had the idea for Portrait of a Thief um, back when I was a recent college grad. And so I was living alone in New York City. And then I heard the news of the true story of Chinese art disappearing from Western museums. And so I was so curious about it. Um, and as I read more, I started to wonder what this sort of situation would look like if instead of expert criminals behind the thieves, they were 
Chinese American college students. And so the rest of the idea sort of developed from over there. Mm -hmm. And how did the how did the story you mentioned it, it develop? But how how did it change? How did it develop? Um, I'm sure you you started yeah you started out with this great idea, but um, how did it become a book? <laughs> Um, so it took a while. Um, I think I started writing it back in 2018. And then I finished the first draft in 2020 during the pandemic. And a lot of the trickiness and the fun of it was planning out this heist novel when we have these characters who aren't expert criminals. They don't know how to pull off a heist. They're regular college students and they're planning everything out from there. And so that was something that was really fun and very challenging to write. And so there was that aspect of it. And there was also the much more personal aspect of writing about Chinese American identity. Mm -hmm. Now, did you take any of, um, cause it's based on, on a true story. There were the, these heists that were going on. Um, did, did you follow any of the line of, of the real life story? Um, how how much does that actually play into it? Yeah, I love that question um, because I think one of the most fun things of writing this book was doing research that involved reading news articles about the real life heist and watching heist movies and that sort of thing. Um, so I definitely took some creative liberties in that we still don't know who's behind the actual heist in real life, um, but for some other aspects, for example, how the characters manage to break into museums, I drew pretty heavily from news articles and the real life situations. That's really fascinating having read the book because these are some pretty, <laughs> pretty dramatic and elaborate heist experience that happens. So that's that's impressive that that was actually pulled off in real life and, and that they're, they're still out there. They have never been found is, is that's the case. Wow. So I'm, I'm wondering, so you said these characters, obviously you, you drew it back and made it, um, and who knows, maybe it was a bunch of high school or college students rather that, that actually ended up doing this, but um, how did you come up with your character development? Are they, are they based loosely on uh, people you know or yourself in other ways or? Um, yeah, so I think that all the characters have a little bit of me in them and that's why I'm able to write them. Um, but a lot of it was drawing from these very classic heist archetypes. So starting off with a leader, a con artist, a getaway driver, a hacker, that sort of thing. And then reimagining what that would look like for Chinese American college students. And so we end up with an art history major, a public policy major, a software engineer working in Silicon Valley and that sort of thing. And so there was part of it that involved thinking about these heist archetypes. And the other aspect was drawing from my own personal identity and experiences. And so one of the characters is from Texas, like me, and another char couple characters went to Duke for college. And some of them are from the Bay Area, which is where I'm zooming in from. Yeah, that's great. Um, so just, just talking about how you you got to the point of actually developing a book that goes into publication that that is going to be on the shelves on April 5th. Um, what is that process like? How did you where did you get in the point of your writing where you did you have like an aha moment like this is this is going to be this is going to be on the shelves. Um, I, um, how did how does that how does that come about? How do you go from just creative writing with an idea to publishing a novel? Yeah, so there was never an aha moment for me. Honestly, when I was writing this during the start of the pandemic, I had no expectation it would be published. All I really wanted was to write a story for myself. I think surrounded by all the grief and the tragedy and my own feeling of helplessness as a medical student, but also oh, not in the hospital, I felt like there was very little I could do. Um, and so I really wanted to tell a story that was for me, that could bring me some bit of joy and escapism during these times. Mm -hmm. And so I finished writing it. And at that point, I had 
I already had a literary agent from a previous book um, that we revised together and workshopped and then ultimately were unable to sell to publishers. So I kind of expected, you know, we would revise together for a couple of years, we would send it to publishers, you know, all of that uncertainty. And then it was, I think, very, very surprising and very wonderful that the process went by quickly in publishing terms. And so it's been um, about two years, which is average to quick. I think books can sometimes take much longer. I, I mean, never, never having written a book or having even tried to go down that path, that sounds, that sounds very quick to me. So congratulations on that. Um, I have, a, I have a question that I want to throw in right off the bat from an audience from uh, New Young. Um, what was your favorite heist movie? And while, while you were doing research, uh, yeah. I love that question. Uh, so I think my go-tos are the classics. So, you know, the Fast and Furious franchise, Ocean's Eleven, most recently Ocean's Eight. Um, I had so much fun. There's a scene in the book um, without spoilers where the characters are watching Ocean's Eleven and taking notes on what's happening. And that was inspired by my own real life research where I sat down with these movies and I took notes on exactly what the characters were doing at every moment. That's, I, that's exactly what I was thinking of when you said that this is, this is actually the process of how you wrote the book. And I'm thinking of these scenes in, in the book where they're planning their heist and, and watching Ocean's Eleven. And, you know, so yeah, I guess, I guess that's, how you, that's how you start, right? <laughs> um, that's great. Um, so uh, without giving anything away, can you just give us a, a brief um, rundown of, of, the, of Portrait of a Thief? Definitely. So the way I see it, Portrait of a Thief is an Asian American heist novel about college students stealing back looted art from Western museums and, of course, inspired by the true story of Chinese art disappearing from museums around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that although this is a heist story, I like to think about it personally as an identity story disguised as a heist story, because while they're robbing museums around the world, they're also trying to figure out who they want to be after graduating college, the lives they want to lead, and the ways that their ambitions and the reality of being Asian American in the United States sometimes clash and sometimes cohere. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, let me throw in a couple more questions here while, while I have you one-on-one -on -one really quick. Um, just a couple of people are wondering about um, just, just more about the, how, how you fit in writing to, to your schedule. I mean, obviously it's a priority to you. It was, it was part of what you studied. Uh, you're, you did creative writing in, in uh, your undergrad. Um, how do you prioritize something like that while being a med student? Yeah, so... I think that, you know, I am still discovering the balance, uh, but a lot of it, I think, is, you know, trying to schedule my time wisely. I read a quote a few years back that I really try to follow, which says, um, do what's important, not what's urgent. And I really like that idea because I think the urgent things will always get done because they have to get done. But you know, sometimes there are things that are important to you. And for me, that's writing. And if you're constantly putting it aside because urgent matters are always cropping up, then eventually the important things will fall by the wayside. And so I, I'm still figuring out my balance, but I like to set aside time to write you know, and really prioritize that and treat that just as much of my, my work as I do, you know, medical school assignments and things like that. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I think that's something that we, we all do throughout the entirety of our lives, but I think that it's important to prioritize as young professionals and young adults as we're, you know, have grand pursuits, but also making time for things that just, just make us happy and we have other passions for. Um, but I do at this point want to bring in uh, Kevin and Holly um, going back to, to what the book was about um, and these, these themes, these thematic um, conversations that continue to come up throughout the book 
And uh, the first in particular I want to talk about, which, you know, could, could be an entire, entire segment in itself, uh, cultural identity. And, um, you know, this is a reoccurring theme throughout the book. The characters wrestle with their own identity, with being American, with um, being Chinese. One of the characters um, grew, grew up for most of his life in China, then moved to America later in life. Um, so I want to ask all of you, uh, what, what is being Chinese American? I mean, it's a very broad question, um, but you know, does, does this change as does, does the best definition change as you get older? Um, does it change in regard to what generation um, American you are, whether first, second, third, um, and how that plays a role in the thought process. So Grace, if you, if you can start it off and then I'll, I'll uh, ask Holly and Kevin to join as well. Yeah, absolutely. I love this question because it's a lot of what I was hoping to explore in my book and also a lot of what I struggled with growing up. I grew up in Pearland, Texas, um, and I would often get questions about you know, where I was really from. I would get compliments on my English. Um, and so even though I was born and raised in the United States, I never felt like I was seen as you know, American enough. And I think that's a fairly common experience for Asian Americans who grew up somewhere that isn't predominantly Asian. Um, and at the same time, when I went back to China to visit my extended family, I would also get you know, questions that I know now were very well-meaning about whether I could speak Chinese, whether I could use chopsticks. Um, and at the time, you know, I felt like I never seemed to belong in either place. I could never be enough. Um, and so a lot of you know, growing older and coming to terms with my identity was being comfortable being Chinese American and knowing that I could occupy both spaces and that I could claim both spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin, uh, do, you, do you mind uh, jumping in and, and giving your thoughts of um, what it is to be Chinese American and does it differentiate, does, will that change as you get older or does it differentiate in regard to first, second, third generation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, you know, thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel uh, to be talking about such an exciting book release um, and, and such a great book. Um, my experience is a little bit different uh, because I would say um, I was born in China, actually. Um, in 2000, I moved to uh, Minnesota in 2006. And so it's an interesting situation because, you know, I'm obviously not second generation by the literal use of the term, but I'm also not quite first generation either in the sense that I don't have the same you know, my upbringing here in the U.S. from such a young age wasn't the same immigrant experience as, for example, my parents had or an earlier generation of uh, Chinese immigrants uh, had here. So I think it's, like in that sense, I am very sort of literally occupying these two spaces where I've, you know, grew up in both places. And so I guess the way I try to sort of reckon with that is to upkeep a lot of the uh, traditions and the sort of uh, cultural um aspects of being Chinese, right? But still having a sense of, okay, um, America is my country now and, and, and I sort of belong here. And, you know, I have a, a sort of very personal investment in, uh, in, in what happens here. Um, so, you know, I still try to uh, speak Chinese at home and, and with relatives, um, it always helps, you know, to have uh, grandparents come and visit. Um, you know, I would say my, in terms of like, you know, writing and reading Chinese, uh, my skills have <laughs> seemingly fallen by the wayside. Um, I'm sure many people can relate. Uh, is Chinese uh, spoken, is that the spoken language in your household? That is generally, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Holly, what do you, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts here? Yeah, um, once again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and meeting Kevin and Grace. The, the entire time I was reading this book, I was just so impressed how you just, like a lot of the uh, our attendees are also just really impressed about how you just balanced it all in your mind. 
And what I love most about this book was how you had five Chinese American stories, but they were all like unique in that, you know, some didn't speak Chinese, some did, some were born in China, some had never been there before. And even within the two siblings, that there was a different Chinese American experience between the siblings. And I feel that with my brother and I as well, because um, for my brother, he essentially lived in Maryland his whole life. But for me, I kind of moved around. Um, I've been in a town where there was barely any Asian Americans versus now in the DC area where, you know, it's very common to see another Asian American. And I love the line that you said in there, but Alex, one of the characters had lived in the West her whole life, but New York City or America was more hers than Beijing had ever had. But then they still do this heist and they still, you know, choose China in a way by, you know, doing a job for them and, you know, essentially taking the fall if they were got, if they got caught. So it's very interesting to see how the spectrum of being Asian American, but yet we still do have this connection and it's not lost whether you speak Chinese or not. And uh, what Gracie said earlier about how sometimes you're not Chinese enough. Sometimes you're too Chinese because I've had experiences in the hospital where patients were really racist to me. Whereas I've had a doctor say to me, oh, you're a banana. So you're white, uh, you're white on the inside, yellow on the outside. So it's, um, you know, inter little interactions like that, it really can get confusing. But I just think that it's so important that we have these conversations and this book um, is, is really going to really open those conversations. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you touched on all the reasons why I wrote the book. So I'm, I'm very moved. <laughs> oh. Well, moving, keeping with the, with the theme of cultural identity, I want to um, bring a little bit of history into the conversation um, with uh, in 1882, Congress passed an act which barred emigration from China to the United States. Um, the last remnants of this law were not abolished until after World War II, um, yet Chinese, Amer Chinese in America were not seen as American, um, a mentality that is still being dealt with today in terms like um, perpetual foreigner, which is a, a, a term that, um, it, you know, is, is, is thrown around and I really think and has been exasperated and elevated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and Holly, you just you made a little bit of reference about, you know, being being in, in school and in, in medical school in a way, you know, like little offhand comments that are made that are like, okay, you know, um, so how do you feel with, how do you deal with facing uh, cultural discrimination or thoughts of combating the perpetual foreign myth? Um, do you want to start with that, Holly, since you just mentioned it a little bit? Yeah, um, I think especially for interactions where it's uh, kind of like rooted in racism. For example, one time I had a patient where she asked me, oh, can you sanitize the room in front of me so I don't get COVID from you? And at the time I was, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Because I was like, oh, COVID, blah, blah. But then I realized because I was the only Asian American in the clinic, probably. And this was when I was in Atlanta. So it was mm -hmm. um, someone who was coming from rural Georgia. And I took an Asian American uh, studies class actually when I was an undergrad and we really touched on the topics of if someone's racist to you um, and because of things like the China's Exclusion Act, people grew up thinking that was the norm. A lot of people don't know that's not, you know, politically correct or hum humanistically correct. So in those situations, um, I would explain to them or if someone asked me, oh, are you from wherever? I'll be like, oh, my family's from China, but you know, I grew up here. I was also born in Texas, uh, things like that. And just be polite, because I think the best way for someone to, because a lot of times you represent your entire race, you know, if you're the only Asian American they know, or the only Asian they know, or the only Chinese American person they know. So to, you know, treat everyone with dignity and respect, even if they don't treat you that way, I think it's a good representation to hopefully next time they meet someone like you to have a better experience. Um, and it is rough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Kevin, um, you, are, you are a history major. So I don't know if you, you had any uh, insight or something you wanted to add to just, uh, you know, bring, bringing that aspect into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I mean, I think something that's incredibly important to realize, and I'm glad you bring up, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act and the sort of 
whole history of anti-Chinese immigration, which I think is so often buried, you know, from school curricula and textbooks and our standard understanding of history, that, you know, America is a nation of immigrants, right? And so the sort of knowledge of this past and understanding of this past and appreciation of this past, uh, which is, you know, part of the reason why museums like this exist, I mean, that that really helps to, I think, allow Chinese Americans to realize, to allow all of them to realize that we have the solidarity, right? That like at every stage in coming to America and becoming, you know, culturally uh, sort of um, integrated, immigrants have faced similar challenges. And so that really, I think, gives a strong base from which, you know, pe- you know everyone can relate to each other. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think too that, you know, the whole sort of pressure to represent one's group is really unfortunate. And I think, you know, sort of true uh, true harmony comes, right? When, you know, one day, hopefully immigrants and people who are different generally from the, from the majority won't have to play respect, respectability politics and feel like they have to represent their whole group because everyone will be, will, will be given the sort of dignity and uh, freedom to be just who they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well said. Yeah, Grace, do you have anything to add to this topic of it? Yeah, I feel like Kevin and Holly really covered a lot of my thoughts about this. And it's really such a joy to be able to have these conversations now, because I think the issues of you know, anti-Asian racism that have been brought to the forefront in the past couple of years have never really gone away. And the myth of the perpetual foreigner, the myth of the model minority are issues that continue to affect the Asian American community. And so I think there are no real easy solutions for it beyond continuing to have these conversations, continuing to speak out and to support other Asian Americans to have these conversations in solidarity with other people of color. And so gradually we move toward more equity, more equality. Mm -hmm. And having these conversations with, 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 with all people, because um, you, you can't just have the conversation in a, in a vacuum, you know, that's something that we, we talk about a lot at the Chinese American Museum, you know, we're, we're elevating one part of um, Chinese American history and the Chinese American experience, but it, it needs to be, it, it, it's history, it's mainstream history, it's not a subset sect of history, um, so it needs to be talked about by all people and you know, these kinds of conversations um, are, are how we start moving that, that conversation forward. And I'm glad you, you brought up the, um, the, the term, uh, the model minority, because that was a, a little bit of a segue of what I wanted to get to next. Um, for people who, who might be on the call that, that don't understand what that is, can you, Grace, tell us what, what is the model minority myth or, yeah. Yeah, so it is, it's the myth that you know, all, all Asian Americans are kind of the exemplar minority. And so it's often used to pit Asian Americans against other minority groups and particularly black Americans where you know, the majority group will say, well, look, like Asian Americans have achieved this level of success through solely hard work. And so we're all on a level playing field here. And instead of spending your time fighting or trying to disrupt the status quo, you too, if you put your head down and you work hard, can achieve the same thing. And of course, there are numerous problems with this. Um, and the one of the big ones is that, you know, Asian America is not a monolith. And so if you look at socioeconomic status and wealth and education, it varies extremely widely when you dive deeper into the ethnic groups that make up Asian America. And Also, of course, the idea of the model minority is used in so many ways to pit Asian Americans against other minorities when really we all need to unite to face oppression and discrimination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin or Holly, did did you wanna add anything to that? She said said it pretty well. So, (laughs) Um, but that also goes right into, uh, the next theme that I really wanted to discuss with you all, um, which is this, this idea throughout the book um, of these familial expectations and pressures, especially in academia. And, you know, this is one of the reasons or one of the catalysts of, of where the model minority myth, I would say, almost comes from. Um, 
so so it's 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 an interesting one and I think it's a conversation that is 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 great to have and this book talks a lot about it um all the characters feel pressures from their family and uh parental units uh, specifically whether whether it, it is fact or whether it's just something that they feel is, is expected of them um, to achieve in in their academics and in their their status um, and you know I think you know not every Chinese American goes to an Ivy League school or becomes a lawyer doctor or computer genius but that that is the identity of, of all the characters in this book um, even the main character, um, Will, though he's an art history major, and that's something that he kind of struggles with throughout the book of, am I, am I living up to the expectation? Is, is this, am I, you know, there's, there's that kind of sense of I'm, I'm falling short. But even he is doing this at Harvard College. So there is still that, that level of credential to him. Um, so I'm wondering, Grace, what, what your thought process was for for making all the characters be a part of this conversation and having that shared story yeah i i love that question and it's something i was really trying to you know, open the conversation up to in my book because i think often among chinese americans there's the idea of you know achievement and this end goal which is often you know getting into a prestigious college and you know, getting a good education, the idea of like, that's when, you, that's when you make it and that's what success is. And so in my book, we have these five characters who by most measures of you know, Chinese American identity have achieved this idea of success where they go to great schools, they have you know, their future ahead of them. And yet, you know, they are not quite satisfied with their life. And so I think a lot of what I wanted to think about was the idea of ambition and how you know, our own personal ambitions may differ from the expectations that are placed on us by you know, parents or by external metrics and how we can kind of sort through that and the pressures that we feel, the pressures that we may create from other people to navigate a life and a future where we can find like real fulfillment and happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so, so Kevin and Holly and, and Grace, because, you know, your guys stories are they're impressively. So um, they kind of follow suit to the stories of the characters, um, just, you know, achieving a prestigious level and pursuing a very prestigious career path. So I'm wondering, do you did you guys feel those pressures from your family growing up to, to achieve this level of, of achievement or success? Or is this, um, is it cultural? Is it part of the, immigra the immigrant story? Um, Polly, a, a, would you wanna start us off a little bit there? Yeah, I feel like my parents were very, I guess, hands off in what career I chose. Um, my dad always just says, whatever you do, just do it well and make sure it makes you happy. And for me, that just turned out to be um, something that was in a career that a lot of, you know, Asian Americans, uh, you know, want to go into, which is medicine. And I'm really glad that when I was reading it, there were some quotes in there that was uh, like Irene spent her whole life doing something right and she was miserable for it. And uh, I do have classmates. I remember in orientation one time, one of the Asian American males was like, oh, I went into medicine because my dad told me to. And I was just really taken aback because um, of course, Grace, um, it's, it's tough. Like med school is hard. It's a long journey. And if you don't love it, it's it, it makes it so much harder um, to be in. And something that I would want to like ask you got you about or people in the audience who are uh, Asian parents is that uh, Grace, you talked about how a lot of Asian Americans, they sign their kids up for drawing classes, dancing classes, painting stuff. But it's kind of ironic because those are not the careers that we're encouraged to go into. So, um, you know, what is the I guess, meaning behind that by wanting to have well-rounded children, but when it's time to choose a career, it's difficult. And 
another, I guess, aspect of it, just looking at, for example, medical school admissions, it's, it's objective. If you, they publish the stats about for Asian Americans, if you have a 99th percentile MCAT, 99th percentile GPA, it's only 40% of those Asian Americans get in compared to other races where it's around 99% of those uh, participants get in. This is published data and it's not really talked about at all. Um, and the only reason I knew is because I was going through the process myself. So it's, it's a very difficult line to, you know, to have on one hand, you know, having the model minority on the other hand, having the expectations of parents on the other hand, just, you know, um, the barriers to entry for a lot of these jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin, do you have any, any, uh, any thoughts or anything to add on this topic? Yeah, I mean, quickly addressing just the, just the point of, you know, family parental pressure. I mean, I think certainly like all archetypes, this is rooted in some degree of reality and cultural custom, otherwise it wouldn't be such. But I think there's also a real pitfall to telling this as a Chinese American story r exclusively, right? In that, you know, I think if this becomes a, a sort of stereotype a, a, as it is that, you know, all Chinese Americans are sort of driven by these family and, and parental pressures, then that really erases the agency of individual people, right? And I think Holly, you bring up a good point with the school admissions is whether or not, you know, you think there are too many or too few Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, et cetera, in schools, I think it is a persistent issue that, you know, you know, Asian American students are often not viewed as having their own interests or their own a sense of motivation or agency, and that's all external. And so I think, you know, really this is a story about how all people experience family and parental pressure and many other pressures and you know, the process of growing up and maturing and becoming a, your own adult is discovering, you know, what drives you individually and sort of come to terms with those pressures. And I think that's what's really important about it all and about, you know, how you reckon with that grace in the book. Uh, I, I love this conversation and I completely agree in that I think that, you know, as Chinese Americans, we, we face certain unique pressures and then we also face pressures that, you know, all 20 somethings, all young adults kind of face. And I think a lot of my approach in writing about this book was thinking about the pressures that we face and kind of the pressures that we put on ourselves often as you know immigrants or children of immigrants where there's not really a safety net often that you can fall back on and so there's this goal of achievement and stability because you know, that's that's kind of the safe path and to what holly was saying earlier i think especially with parents signing up their children for a bunch of different interests and that part of the book which was inspired by my own experiences i think that for my parents who you know grew up in rural china this presented an opportunity to give give me and give my siblings these chances to explore that they were never really given and so you know to be solidly middle class to sign us up for art and for music and for dance. And then at the same time, you know, when it comes to choosing a career, I think that the most important thing to remember about the Chinese American experience is that it's not one experience. And in terms of Asian America, the experience varies widely in terms of the pressures that you feel or the pressures that you don't feel. And with college admissions or med school admissions, I know one of my ongoing gripes as someone in med school is that this data is never disaggregated. And I think that the experience of you know, what ethnicity within the big umbrella of Asian America matters a great deal. And that I would love it if those you know, both within and outside of the identity of Asian American can be more willing to see all of us in our unique capabilities and our interests as opposed to passing these certain specific judgments about this is, you know, the one definition of what it means to be Asian American, because that never can encompass the whole thing. Yeah, and that that actually goes right into to the next uh, theme I wanted to talk with you all about is is personal identity. Um, I think that the book talks a lot about, you know, what it means to be Asian American and and sorting that out for yourself personally and what your family experiences personally. So um, how do you, what in carving your own professional path, I think that 
you know, for the first time, and this this is not unique to to the Asian American Chinese experience. Um, we're we're at a point where I think a lot of people are blending their hobbies and their passions and and something that can you know put the bread on the table every day. But um, and and you are are a perfect example of this, Grace, by by putting an emphasis on your passion to write and um, ensuring that you give yourself the space and the time to do that. Um, that's, that's very personal. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're not in a, in a place of, we're, we're not following linear, linear paths anymore. We're, we're blending and, and building ourselves in that way. So how, how are you all finding your personal identities? What are you blending? What are you making time for? Um, I guess, Grace, we know a lot about what you're doing, but there, I'm sure there's other things, but Kevin and Holly being, being in the thick of things as students right now um, and with, with ambitious careers ahead of you, um, how, how are you making it personal for yourselves? Uh, Kevin, if I could start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I spend most of my time these days at the uh, radio station here on campus where I actually am right now. Um, but, you know, I, I uh, grew up playing piano, um, very into classical music. And, you know, in college, um, I, I still sort of dabble on the instrument. But I find this a really, really uh, sort of engaging and interesting way to uh, interact with music without the attendant pressures, you know, of performance uh, and uh, uh, of, you know, having to keep oneself not just something uh, to a very rigorous sort of schedule and expectations, you know, I think this is such an interesting way to uh, continue to engage with music and to bring it to the wider community and uh, and to be able to tell interesting stories about it uh, without necessarily, yeah, having to follow the path of, okay, you just have to you know, play an instrument. And uh, I'm sure many Chinese American children, of course, grew up playing an instrument. Um, but, but, you know, I think there are so many other interesting ways to engage with this particular passion. And so that's what I've really spent all my time doing. And I think it's done me a lot of good. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I played piano and flute till I was into high school. So I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, Holly, what about you? Um, I think a quote that could really, I guess, preface my answer is when Daniel in the book says, I hate personal growth. <laughs> um, I think for a lot of Asian Americans, it's hard because you're always pushed to go from music class to math prep classes, to schoolwork, to for, or swim practice, things like that. Um, and there is there there is little room, I think, growing up to feel like, oh, who am I like outside of school, outside of um, other things I do my days, uh, most of the days, my average week is I'll go into the hospital four days a week to do research. Um, and then I'll do schoolwork. And when someone asks me, what's your hobby? I'm, I'm kind of confused on that. <laughs> like, what is my hobby? Um, so I think that I also need to, or I do hate personal growth myself because it's, it's difficult to do, but you know, within the hospital, I work uh, at a wound center. So there's plastic surgeons there. And what I realized, what I love within medicine is helping people, I helping people who genuinely need it versus a lot of people want to go into aesthetics, things like that. Um, where I realized that's not really the field that I want to go into. So I think just really exploring or learning to say no as well. That's a big lesson that I learned is you don't have to say yes to every opportunity that comes to you or else that's just going to make you miserable and that's going to stunt your personal growth. And just really kind of, I've been trying to journal at night to reflect on, you know, what I liked, what I didn't like, and, you know, to improve on those things as well. So yeah, for here's to personal growth. <laughs> <laughs> here's to personal growth. <laughs> And Grace, I don't, I don't know if, um, because all of the characters in your book had had very distinct personal identities. And I mean, there's, there's a car racer. There's a, um, so, so what, I, I know that that was an important aspect of your writing to, to give each of these characters very solid individual identities. Um, and do these identities reflect uh, passions of yours too? Or, or where, I guess this goes back to uh, character development, but uh, if you could just talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll give a brief you know, intro into some of the characters' hobbies and then match them up to some of my own. Um, and so we start off with Will, who's, uh, you know, the leader of the highest season art history major at Harvard. And I am a tour guide at Stanford's Art Museum. And so my interest in art definitely is reflected a little bit in him. And then for 
are a street racer. I I definitely do not race cars in my free time. But you should have told well, me. You're <laughs> a natural race car driver. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I I love the Fast and Furious movies. So I guess that's that's the comparison over there. Um, and I think outside of writing, especially during the pandemic, I think it's really lovely and valuable to have hobbies where you know you aren't expected to be particularly good at them. Um, and so I've recently picked up tennis again. I've started cooking. I've been going on just walks outdoors to, to breathe in some fresh air. And I think mm-hmm. just having that time to take a break and to just reflect on my life and the world around me is also really useful for writing, but also just in my own personal development. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, I do want to, I want to turn to our, uh, our, uh, our Q and A, cause it's, it is filling up here. And I, I feel like this, this hour flew, we're already at 10 minutes of the hour. <laughs> um, but, um, I have a uh, congratulations. Could you please give young writers some advice on how to finish what they start? Have you thought about quitting during writing this book? Uh, I love that question. And um, in terms of finishing what you start, I honestly, for many, many years, I thought I would never finish um, any story. I you know, started writing some novels when I was younger, um, but they never made it past maybe 20 pages. So an, unfinished Word doc on my computer. And I thought for a while that that would be my whole life. I would have a collection of unfinished stories. Mm. Um, And so I think that something I wish I could have told myself as a young writer is just to to enjoy the process, to read widely, to write, to not feel pressure to finish something or to finish quickly or to get published or to write something while very young. because I think a lot of the growth and the joy of writing is when you discover a story and you, you think, I want to write it because I want to read it. And then you, know, you, you feel kind of compelled to keep going from there. And so you know, a, lot of, a lot of writing, I think, for me is, is maintaining that joy and the wonder of discovery. Mm, yeah. Um, so somebody else wants to know how many drafts um, before you, before the book was finally published? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would have to pull up my files. Let's see. Um, so I went through, I wrote a first draft and then I sent it to several friends and critique partners to read and I revised it. So that would be what that would take us to maybe draft number four. And then I revised it twice with my agent. And Mm -hmm. so that has a set seven. And then I did one bigger round and one smaller round with my editor. And then I had a copy editor and we did two and then we had a proofreader. So two more. So I think that brings us to a total of 17. Wow. <laughs> and how, because you, so you said it took two years to write the book. So is, is this editing process within those two years too? Or? Um, so I started writing it in 2018, maybe, and it comes out next week. And so that's, that's four years. That and done. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) That's amazing. 17 drafts. Um, How did you, how did you pick a question for me? How did you pick um, the the people that, that were going to critique your work? Uh, I mean, that's very personal. Um, Like best friends, parents, is there anyone who was on your docket that after initial conversations were like, I'm never showing you my draft again? (laughs) (laughs) So I, I feel very lucky in that I have several close writer friends that I've known for years. Um, And so part of, you know, the joy of being in writing and you know sometimes when things take a little longer is that all your friends you know get published and have books come out and achieve amazing success um, while you're still still working um, and so I had several writer friends who I've known for years who were able to read this book and who had read previous books of mine and then I also had my sister read it. My, my family and some other close friends, they didn't read it until everything was done. 
because I thought, you know, mm-hmm. if I'm giving this to my dad, it's got to, it's got to make perfect sense. I can't have any errors in you know, <laughs> my spelling. I can't have any of the Chinese characters, you know, misspelled. So, so some people in my life, they, they get the final polished version right, and then right. <laughs> other people, I give them the early version. I say, help me out here. Yeah. Um, so I guess that, that goes into another question from the audience. Um, uh, did you receive support from your family in writing and, and what were their reactions to, to your, to the book? Yeah. So my family is super supportive. Um, I think for many years, writing felt intensely private to me because it was something that I did just for me. And also I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. Mm. And so I just, I just wrote my little stories and kept them to myself. Um, So it's been, it's been a really strange and surprising and wonderful experience to talk about it a little more openly. Um, so my my sister was one of the very first readers of my book. She was maybe the first one. Um, my younger brother, he is at Harvard. So he read it and fact checked all my Harvard references. And then my parents read it maybe um, six months or a year ago. And that was that was really nice. My mom read it and then she started rereading it again recently. And she told me that when she reads it, she discovers new things about me in the process. I bet. Oh, that's lovely. I love that. <laughs> um, Kevin and Holly, I, I want to give you guys, um, I mean, you're, I want to give you guys open opportunity to ask any questions you have of your own um, or, or further the conversation. Is there anything that you guys want to add at this point or particular questions to Grace or any other insight on any of the conversation we've had to this point? I'll take the liberty of asking a question, um, maybe about the book. Um, I was sort of curious, and you know, having heard, I guess, the initial question at the beginning of this talk, your sort of uh, immediate cause of writing the book was, you know, reading about the heist in the news and that sort of thing. But you know, I was wondering, what do you think makes this sort of plot and the sort of topic of uh, Chinese cultural artifacts and uh, the debate surrounding that these sort of broader um, theme of Chinese history, what do you think makes that a, 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 an apt way through which to explore Chinese American identity? Yeah, I love this question. And I think personally, in general, I've always been interested in the idea of looted art because you know of all its implications for history and for art and for culture and the meaning of you know, art as a symbol for power. Um, but I think in terms of specifically for this book and my reasons for writing it, I think there are there are some really fun metaphors to be drawn between the idea of this art that was looted from China and is now scattered across the Western world and the own ex- my own experience of being part of the Chinese diaspora and trying to navigate my own identity and what it means to you know, figure out where is home and where I belong to and my own relationship with China. And so we have a lot of fun interactions between art and culture and self within the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Holly, any, any other, uh, any other last thoughts from you or comments? I'm just really impressed by like everything you've done, especially like the fact that it's going to be on Netflix and it's going to reach so many people. It's going to be, you know, the next Joy Luck Club, Crazy Rich Asians, those kinds of, it's going to be like that caliber of like a project. So, um, congratulations. I, I'm in awe of you. Uh, thank you for <laughs> taking the time to talk to us today. I learned so much and I thoroughly enjoyed your book. I'm going to be recommending this to everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to that note, Grace, um, we want to hear more about, about what's next for the book. Um, can you just give us a rundown of, of what the agenda is? I and mean, you have an extremely busy like next week of the life of this book. <laughs> Um, and then also uh, Netflix, we haven't even talked about that yet. So just, just tell us what's next, what you, what's going on. Yeah, so lots of things up ahead. This is, I think the very first event I'm doing to launch my book into the world next week, but I am having a launch event in Mountain View, California, the bookstore, five minutes from my apartment next Tuesday. And then after that, I am heading to Durham, North Carolina, Houston, LA, New York City, um, I think back over here in DC and a few other places along the way. Mm -hmm. And I believe everyone will have access to 
my schedule via my website and all of that will be sent out yeah. at some point. So I'm, I'm really excited um, in terms of Netflix. I am meeting up with my Netflix team when I am in LA. And so I'm really excited to chat more about that. I'm, I'm not sure how much is public information yet since I did sign several documents, but I will say that the team is really, really wonderful. Um, there are Asian Americans and people of color working on the team. And so I have a ton of faith that the adaptation will be very well done and truthful to the Asian American experience. So I'm very excited. Yeah. And you're, you're going to be very instrumental in, in that process too, right? So you're going to make sure that everybody is uh, represented just the way you, you see fit. So that's, that's awesome. Um, well, uh, we are nearing the top of the hour. Um, I think that we've answered most of the questions that have come in. Uh, David, Uwe, if you can uh, put up just our, our closing slide for the day. Um, Holly and Kevin, and especially Grace, I wanna thank you guys all so much for, for joining the Chinese American Museum today for this conversation. Um, we're all so excited for this book launch. Um, all, those of us who have had the privilege to read it so far, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, everyone go get a copy as soon as it comes out. Um, release date again is Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. Um, uh, Grace's website is there too, www.graceulee.com. Uh, on her website, you can see, as she mentioned, all her upcoming events, um, uh, ways to pre-order the book um, and just learn more about Grace and uh, upcoming things with her. Uh, noted as well, we do have a book signing scheduled uh, with Grace at the Chinese American Museum on Saturday, May 21st. So do mark your calendars for that. Uh, we'll be selling the book at the museum. Uh, Grace will be there to greet you, to sign a copy for you, and just to uh, chat more about, about the book itself. Um, so thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Grace. Good luck in, in everything in this next new venture of, um, I mean, it's not new for you. You've been doing it for four years now, but this next step is, is amazing. So congrats to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to Holly and Kevin. This was such a wonderful conversation. And thank you to everyone for attending this event and all your wonderful questions. I had such a great conversation. All right, we'll see you all soon. Thanks for joining us and have a good evening.